Okay, let me introduce. My name is Anne uh, Gifuku Shongwe, and I'm the representative for UN Women um, in Southern Africa, but I'm here representing UN Women in general. The topic for today is making global goals look uh, local business. Making global goals uh, local for business in Africa. Um, and this is really our gender equality panel. So this is a panel that's going to look at you know, how are we doing on gender equality? What advances are we making? What's holding us back um, as, as the private sector? And the, the, yeah, that's who we are. Maybe we should all introduce ourselves. Jane, to you. Okay, so I'm Jane Karuku. I'm the MD of Kenya Breweries in Kenya. And I want, I'll talk to you about uh, what we are doing as a business to try and make sure that we have gender equality. So over to... Khaled. Hello, my name is uh, Khaled Enda, handling Youth In, a social company assisting local stakeholders in uh, resilience achievements. Bridget Morocco. Hi, um, I'm Bridget Backman. I'm Bridget, the director. are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Bridget? Yes, we can hear. Yes. We can hear Bridget, yeah. Okay, hi, my my name is Bridget Backman, and I'm the Director for Global um, Corporate Regulatory Affairs at Distel. I'm based in South Africa, and I'm just going to share some of my company's journey, but also a little bit about the UNGC um, South Africa as a board member, no, can I see what her? we are doing. And, um, I think Jane said she can hear me. I can hear you very quickly. Uh, I mean, very well. I can even repeat, you're from Distel and you talk to us today. <laughs> wow. Thanks, thanks, so, Jane. Yeah, so uh, I think we need to, to move on. Uh, shall we start yeah. with the gentleman? Because he's the only one while well, Anne fixes her hearing. So, Khaled, <laughs> talk to us about uh, this agenda, uh, gender parity, <laughs> from your view. So, um, thanks for inviting me for this uh, uh, amazing discussion about how we can achieve women parity and, and also women inclusion maturity in, in Africa. In fact, the resilience remains a long journey and the private sector should be a part of it. The women inclusion maturity requires real field involvement of all stakeholders, not only government, civil society, development agencies, and also the private companies have the flexibility to solve the SDG challenges and to contribute really by being more involved in, in, in the field. We, in fact, uh, I think uh, in the first level, we have to speak instead of economic profitability money, we have also to speak about resilience uh, and also sustainability. I think we can perfectly merge between doing business and also holding and achieving in SDG challenges because enterprises or private companies in general have also the responsibility to keep uh, a sustainable planet, uh, dry communities, and also a smart change for a better tomorrow for moon Africa. In fact, uh, recently we were involved in the biggest uh, assessment in Africa related to uh, inclusive business, social and inclusive business, and we remarked that women was mostly involved in inclusive business. They were able to advocate, they were able to share their insight, they were able to bring value to business. This is the amazing uh, part of, of the assessment. Women are able to bring values in business to make it sustainable and also profitable for us to call it. This is for me, and, and also I, I can reassure the attendance that uh, women in Africa are, are really moving. They, 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 we make some successful stories because the, the studies were concerning 16, 16 countries. So we have a whole picture about when women can be more involved in achieving SDGs. So I can say that we are on the right way, uh, small steps indeed, but we are on the right way to achieve SDG growth for, for the uh, Okay, thank you, Khaled. Uh, Bridget, you want to tell us, you want to talk to us about this agenda?
Bridget, did you hear me? Looks like we've lost Bridget, so maybe I can go. So, so I think from a corporate, uh, I work for Diageo in Kenya, and we are private sector, and we've really taken to heart this agenda of women and gender parity at work in all aspects of employment. And I think uh, for us, we have a, a, a strong belief that it is important because consumers, our consumers are 50-50, and therefore our, employ our employees must reflect who our consumers are. And therefore, we've called out this agenda as our must-do number five under inclusion and diversity. Now, we also believe that for performance, you do women proper gender representation and diversity in your employee base so that you can succeed and do well. So therefore, it's, it's a must. It's not a if or when. It is now, and we are doing it, and I think all companies have to do it. So, so therefore, as we look into the future, we are taking this gender, this inclusion and diversity agenda over the next ten, five to 10 years, leveraging our brands, our people, and because we are a global company, our global footprint. And we, we want, by 2030, we want to look back and feel very good as a business in terms of uh, what we did from an inclusion and diversity perspective. This com commitment is not new. It is about us stepping up to the brilliant execution of our progressive inclusion and diversity framework across the business, and even further to lead the way for our peers. Just last week, we launched the Diageo 2030 goals, including our ambition for diversity across our leadership. And we've set very ag uh, aggressive targets. So we want to champion gender diversity with an ambition to achieve 50% representation of women leadership roles by 2030. We would also like to champion ethnic diversity with an ambition to increase representation of leaders from ethnically diverse backgrounds to 45% by 2030. Maybe I stop there and check whether Anne now you can hear us and make your contribution. Thank you so much, Jane. I'm very impressed with your 50% goal. I really like that. Um, let me say that for us at UN Women, um, you know, our, our deep concern is that unless we shift this uh, gender equality discussion to the center of all businesses, the World Economic Forum data that says that we're 100 years away from gender equality will be a reality. Um, and so one of the big things that we've been really focusing our attention on is, uh, together with the Global Compact, the Women Empowerment Principles. And what's important mm -hmm. about the Women Empowerment Principles is that it goes beyond the parity discussion, which I think a lot of companies um, invest in. And so parity is important for us, but like you're saying, uh, uh, Jane, as you talk about your 50% target in leadership, we have evidence that um, at 30% on the boards, this is, I think, an, an EY study done some years ago, would result in about 8% revenue growth. So it's not a cool thing to do. It's, it's, it's really uh, a business imperative. Um, the other big thing that we know is that when businesses buy from women, from women or businesses, when corporates bring real value into their businesses, they buy from women businesses, and that co contributes easily 20 to 25% of GDP. So within this women empowerment principles, we look at parity, we look at the supply chain, we look at violence and harassment in the workplace, we look at... Um, uh, at measures such as marketing and advertising. And in every one of these, we now have about uh, 2,700 companies across the world with signatories. I think in, in Africa, we are close to 1,000. And with companies now beginning to take seriously these investments in, in, in uh, gender equality across all seven principles, we, we know that we can achieve the targets um, that we want to achieve, to really achieve that 50% 2030 for you. But for us at UN Women, 2030 is the expiration of gender inequality. We want to see an end in gender inequality across companies. So across these areas, we've got all kinds of data. So for instance, uh, thinking about Diageo, you invest in a lot and, uh, and distill, you invest a lot in advertising and marketing of big brands. Um, our data and our work with the Unstereotype Alliance points to the fact that 
um, increased uh, and stereotyped advertising, which really represents women um, and men and, and all in their diversity in ways that is empowering and strong, um, increases purchase intent by 25% across the board and by 45% for women. So every one of these data, we can give you data points that show why it is valuable to invest in gender equality across the board. So let me let me stop there, um, and let's uh, you know I'll bring on more questions, more more points as we go. Okay, Bridget. Yeah. Bridget has in chat. Yes. Herself. Um, hi. So um, from from the Stal's perspective, very similar to what Jane was saying, our our consumer base. Um, is also um, female. So from a business perspective, um, SDG 5 and gender equality just met, was common sense um, for us. So in terms of implementing the SDGs, we decided on four foundational SDGs and then, um, sorry, four primary SDGs and two foundational SDGs. And SDG 5 for gender equality and SDG 17 for partnerships are actually our foundational SDGs. By the fact that they the foundational SDGs means that they have to be woven into the overarching strategy of the company. It is not a standalone um, um, exercise that only resides in a CSI or in an HR uh, department. And so from, from that perspective, we've actually even in, um, included the SDGs, including of SDG 5, in our short-term incentive scheme for this financial year. It makes up 20% um, of, and it's one of the three measures chosen for the whole company's um, performance. But much more than being the right thing to do, we want to be a company, I really, and I think that's probably for all of us, we want to reflect our customers, but more importantly, um, we actually want the communities where we operate to be better off because we're there. So, and women make up on average 50% of the population in some regions more. Um, a friend tagged me on the LinkedIn post to say hashtag new majority for Africa because women are 60% um, on this continent. So I thought that was quite a nice um, hashtag. And then um, we employ over a thousand women and we have 30% roughly on our board. But most importantly, and for me, it is about the business case. Because as we know in business, you know, business doesn't just embrace something. Um, you know, there are numbers and metrics and thoughts and it's the right thing to do and ethos. And I think the more we demonstrate the strength of the business case for gender equality, which is unequivocal and cannot really be challenged, the more companies we will have that come on board and that are willing um, to set these ambitious targets of, in our case, 45% by 2025, um, we've set five-year um, targets. Um, in, in that, but we've also set targets in the supply chain, which I think maybe we can chat about um, later. It's not just about equality at management level internally. I've become the, the impromptu, whatever, moderator. So Khaled, uh, what are you thinking about this topic? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think the key word is, I think we have two key words. One is, education. I think the SDGs or the planning challenges should be involved before doing business, should be involved in universities, in high schools, because we cannot hold value without, without having a basic knowledge and also uh, a real involvement earlier before doing business on, on the field. I think we have also worked on awareness companies. Are we explaining well the what are the SDGs for companies? How much the companies are aware about ETGs? How much they are involved in really in ETGs? I think we have to do field work to aware CEOs, uh, to aware uh, all the all the company stakeholders, and, uh, um, let's say professional societies, and all the stakeholders to aware them about the importance on handling the values, on doing business and hybrid business, doing business profitability and also uh, holding some some social challenges. 
I think the key words is education and awareness along the, the, the period uh, earlier of, of doing business in university and also high schools to mention the people that they have the responsibility to maintain a good planet and also inclusive communities. Before we ha hand over to Anne, I think I wanted to build on something you said. I think it has to be total ecosystem because I think this problem will be sorted out when everybody across the value chains. Uh, and I think even Bridget, you, talk, you talked about it, whether it's an employee, whether it's your supplier, a farmer, the trade, especially in our industry with Brigitte, I think we must make sure that there, there is proper representation of diversity. And we've set ourselves targets. So we say we are going to glass organization. And therefore, from a farmer's perspective, we are trying to increase the number of farmers who are women and even from uh, physically challenged or, or, or disabled in whichever form or way. We're then making sure that employees own this in part of your agenda. And in fact, we in Kenya, we were awarded the other day by KEPSA because we are tracking 13 out of the 17 goals. And we've, we've uh, cascaded these 13 goals to every part of the organization. So if somebody is in supply, they'll catch one, maybe on water. If somebody is, on, is in HR, they'll, cut, they'll catch the one of uh, diversity and inclusion. If it's in brands, in fact, last week we had a good session because we're trying to be having, we're trying to always be progressive in portrayal, in advertising. I think, Anne, you, you talked about it. So I think it's, it needs to be deep, but I, more importantly, I think it's a leadership issue. So it needs to be a leadership priority or a leadership mandate that you drive inclusion and diversity because you know the tone comes from the top. And if leadership is talking about it, then, then it's okay. And I'll give you an example of what we've done. So as a leader, I have, I have targets. The first target is to make sure that I have proper representation in talent planning that is geared towards attracting, retaining, and developing the most diverse uh, talent within the business, which will, ref of course, reflecting our consumer base. The second thing is to make sure that there is inclusive leadership and capability, always training people, to make sure that they have no unconscious bias with tools and learning opportunities to make sure that whatever we do, we are quite inclusive. The third one is ensuring that diversity and inclusion covers the intent of everybody across the communities in where, where we operate. And we make sure that we are recognizing those people who are doing very well to encourage that culture and that behavior. And then the fourth one, just relates to portrayal of our brands like I've talked about, because we do need our employer brand to look diverse. We also need to make sure that our brands are portraying that they are neutral or, or they're, they're being fair and they're and they dismantling any steel stereotypes that we may have had. I think uh, our senior leadership, because of this, uh, our senior leadership is really growing from a representation perspective. I think our very senior leadership, we have 27% representation of um, senior women. And at the lower, just slightly lower, it's 37%. So we are on our journey. And like I said, by 2025, we hope to have gotten 50-50. The other thing we are doing to make sure that we are not just not talking, we, we have adopted a STEM apprentice program, which is attracting young women in their early career, especially in science, technology, engineering, and math. And these are areas traditionally where women were not, sort of, there were not many. And we need to make sure as well, even when we bring them on board, that there is conducive environment for them to thrive. So in Kenya, we were the first guys to move maternity from two months to six months, which was frowned upon, but I think we've seen a lot of organizations following following this. And then we also gave guys one month paternity. I'm not sure that they are taking it, uh, but uh, it is there in the business to encourage sort of a gender. We are not sure that we are discriminating. So Anne, you want to add on to something? To those few things? First of all, I am so impressed. I really am impressed to hear this, uh, um, you know, leading from in front. And I think I, I do want to point to the fact that you are a woman leader and a woman leader will make sure that you're paying attention to, to these facts. One of the things we found most difficult, um, but also our best challenge um, at UN Women when working with our now over 2,700 companies that are signatories of the Women Empowerment Principles, is to work with men. 
in particular. And so we have our He for She impact uh, uh, in global program where we really are targeting the CEOs of companies, male CEOs in particular, and asking them to make the kind of commitments that you've talked about, Jane, from a personal level, you know, how am I going to make sure that I am leading from in front and that I'm establishing policies that are showing zero tolerance to discrimination? Um, you know, we do the unconscious bias training, but how do you actually translate that into unconscious bias practice? Uh, one of the things that we are in, in, on a journey to right at this current moment is the big issue of violence and harassment in the workplace. The workplace. Again, this is a cost to the business. This is a cost to the economy. We've actually got data now that it's anywhere between 1% and 7%, depending on how big the issue is to the GDP, um, which is, you know, I mean, 1% of the GDP is massive uh, in terms of the cost of violence. Um, and so the kind of um, uh, policies that we are now pushing is to say every single business Lead, starting from the top, has to have a violence and harassment workplace policy, but also um, one that is has got very straightforward mechanisms to ensure that everybody can actually report cases. There's anonymity uh, if, if need be, and so on. So that's another point I want to raise. But you know, where men have taken the responsibility to lead, have have had the um, the guts to have uh, thirty to even fifty percent women. Um, in leadership at, at the board level, those companies are transforming and are producing real results. So we, you know, um, as you and women, we've worked for many years with women as activists and we are in the front and we are out there, you know, raising our fists, but it is transformational when men themselves lead from in front. And so that's one of the things that we really want to push. Um, and, and that we are working with businesses to see. The Unstereotype Alliance is another uh, campaign that we've, we've, we've initiated, and it's only a couple of years now. Um, so, but, but we're finding that many marketing uh, teams in big brands and a lot of the agencies that big brands work with are not sensitized to the, the, the vision that, that you as a company has. And so, you know, we just had a really dramatic case in South Africa where uh, there was a, an ad that was put out that was entirely racist and also sexist in the way in which it was put out. And so, you know, this cost the business. The business had to fire people. They had to, you know, they lost, they lost money. And so uh, really inviting companies to, one, be signatories of the women empowerment principles because you have a tool that can audit your gender equality practice from parity to your community engagement. I really liked what you were saying, um, uh, Jane, but also starting to look at how does that translate into how you, how you project yourself. Um, and then the last one, which I want to raise, which is what Bridget was talking about, was the issue of buying from women. We have to buy from women. Across the world, companies and, 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 and the public sector buy maximum um, from 1% women businesses. So whether it's your, your, your services that you're buying, you know, your, your paper and pens, or your, your actual uh, core value, you have to be able, we, you know, we are pushing for 30% across Africa, that every company has to buy at least 30%. And I don't even know why we're at 30% and not at 50%, but at least 30% of everything that you buy. When we start seeing a translation of who you buy from, then we know you're walking the talk. Um, at this point, it is really, really poor. It is really poor how much we buy from women businesses. Um, and, 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 and I liked what you said, Jane, that it's not just about the end product, it's about across the entire value chain. So at what point, who are you bringing in, whether it's the farmers who are providing, uh, but also ultimately, uh, if we look at your, your end year uh, sustainability report, can we actually see your, your numbers there? Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Maybe I can just add there around um, programs. And, and I must say, um, we did the um, web gap analysis, and it's a lovely, sobering um, exercise. So I would uh, recommend that other companies do it. It really provides a, a, a guiding framework 
for you to re understand where your gaps are as a company and then how you can work um, to close them. It's become a bit of an energizing uh, factor for us in our space having done that uh, web analysis. And so I think, uh, thanks for the great work um, there. Jane also mentioned um, around the whole value chain. So, and I think the one thing, uh, given that there are two alcohol um, producers on this call, um, you know, we maybe should not skirt around um, the fact that the abuse of alcohol um, can actually um, lead um, to irresponsible behavior. So um, given that we have embarked on a big um, alcohol harm reduction program, um, we've seen in South Africa that GBV spiked during COVID, where women unfortunately were now in their household with the perpetrator. Um, but of course, charity begins at home. So the first thing we did is we launched an internal campaign, Never In Our Name, which every employee is actually asked to sign. It's a, it's a charter for leadership behavior and employee behavior. And when we launched this to the top 500, we did something which at the time didn't seem courageous. Uh, it just seemed the right thing to do, but everyone's come back to tell us we're courageous and so now we feel courageous. Um, at least that we actually launched it by choosing a perpetrator to come and talk. So a reformed male perpetrator um, actually came um, to talk to us and that really set the tone for employees. We will be doing our check on how many people have signed up uh, to the charter and the behavior. Um, but also, of course, behind that, you have to have, because, because GBV is a multifaceted um, challenge we face in all societies, um, we need to have a multifaceted approach. So part of the approach is a Taverna training program where we've added a GBV module. We've started Tavern Dialogues where we actually have dialogues in the taverns um, around GBV, um, good role modeling um, behavior, but then also around safety and protocols and ambiance and all of what a good safe tavern should look like so that as, as women, people wouldn't feel afraid to have to wander um, around or visit um, a tavern. We've set targets for this year for 10% Black women-owned businesses. So we've actually made a distinction, given the South African legislation, between Black women-owned and women-owned generally. So our target for Black women-owned is 10% for this year, and our target for Black-owned um, businesses is 23% um, for this year. And every year we have quite a big step change um, in that. The other thing that always worries me is that in leaders, when we talk gender equality, we often think about management. You know, it's about having people in top positions. But I think all of us have said in some way or another that um, gender equality is part of human rights. So for us, it starts at the farm worker. And we've set up a social compliance journey where we have an NGO that audits not only our farms, but um, a few farms every year we add to the program. We're adding 10 more this year, actually monitoring and giving us a report on the human rights, including gender, um, on the farms that supply us. Now, 95% of our produce comes from other farms. And we have got a pool of willing suppliers. Obviously, after that analysis, there's a gap analysis. And then the NGO will assist um, with closing the gaps that has been picked up in terms of social compliance. So as you were saying, and you have to look at everything um, in your value chain from upstream to who supplies you to downstream to who's selling your product and then everything in between internally and marketing as well. Thank you. Yes, as we conclude, because it's top of the hour, we can probably look at challenges very briefly. Mm -hmm. What challenges will stop this agenda from not working? Maybe we start with Khaled. 
and then I'll talk, we'll come back to Bridget and Anne, you will close and summarize what we've been discussing. <laughs> I think we have to make bridges with, with companies and also vulnerable communities. Let me give you a simple example. We have reached some human resources director to encourage their employees to adapt responsible uh, consumer. So we did virtual exhibition between employees and also women handling uh, local business in rural uh, areas. So we would look at the, the two worlds, the business world and also the, the, the social world. I think it, it was and people were adapting how people and to get connected with the with talented women and vulnerable uh, communities in order to help and also to hold some 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 business value. I think for the for the agenda we we uh, have to to uh, to speak hybrid business mixing business and also values and also resilience sustainability we have to, uh, to incorporate in the in the board's meetings and also we have to speak about awareness and education. Thank you. Alad, before I hand over to Bridget and then onward to Anne to conclude, I think for us it starts with everybody. It starts with me. And I think what we need to do is to get commitment from everybody, whether you're a leader, whether you're a parent. Because I think also the challenge is that women are not putting there, they're not volunteering to be considered either to do business, to get these jobs, or to do challenging things that men can do. So I think there's a challenge on all of us in the total ecosystem to encourage people to put to put their foot forward for consideration. I also think that we need to work around our ecosystem also to stop the biases, because I think the biases still really exist. And then I think, uh, Bridget, to your good point, I think uh, in Kenya, we're also doing a lot of work on positive drinking. In fact, we've succeeded mm -hmm. to make it part of uh, Drink IQ, part of a driving school cu curriculum in Kenya. So, which I think is good, and we're trying to see what we can do in high schools to make sure that people do not abuse alcohol, because that's another challenge that probably we should have talked a lot more, but time is up. Is up. So over to you, Bridget, and then you can hand over to Anne, and we can conclude. Yeah, having I think having grown up in um, apartheid South Africa, cultural stereotypes and and the patriarchy really constrains trust. I think we have a huge trust deficit in South Africa, whether it's between business and government, between men and female, between business and NGOs, um, between society and government, society and business. And in a way that also then constrains respect for women who assume leadership and decision-making positions. And sometimes covertly and sometimes very overtly, um, there is almost a diminishing of the role of women leaders and their ability to act and their aptitude to influence that happens in the workplace. Um, on the other hand, though, for entrepreneurs, economic exclusion is also a challenge and a barrier that one has to be aware of. From uh, antiquated legislation where the husband still has to sign, even if uh, the woman wants to own a business, to access to funding where you are required to provide a plethora of um, resources in order to actually start um, your business. The other one is the, um, and I think you spoke about that unconscious bias. You know, we all have unconscious bias and sometimes that window has to be opened for us. Um, it doesn't happen automatically. So I do think programs that foster the lifting of an, or, or shifting of unconscious bias is very important. And then I'm a believer because I am BB. I always try to make things simple by putting it as I'm called B squared by my friends. So I always try to put something in squares. So I wrote down something uh, early this morning in squares. I said, challenges and barriers can for me are, are two words. It's P squared and M squared. And so P squared is for the patriarchy and the paradigms we continue to live in. And M squared is for misogyny and mindsets. And so we have to move from patriarchy through to matriarchy, through to interdependence. 
And then we have to change paradigms and we have to shift our own mindsets and try for the next generation to come changing their mindsets um, as well by role modeling better behavior and achieving better outcomes. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Khalid. Wow, I feel like that was the concluding <laughs> remark. But anyway, let me, <laughs> let me just say, and I don't know whether Elizabeth wants to join us at the end of this, but just to say that, you know, we've been talking about how um, 2030 is expiration for gender equality. And every single uh, business and private sector company across the world and across this Africa of ours has to make their contribution to this. Um, and I think that we have had the kind of discussion that identifies how uh, we start with leadership, but we translate that into the entire ecosystem of your business and making sure that those biases um, are dealt with at every single level and that we go, whether it's from the farms to the, uh, you know, we, we see many companies where the entry level, we have 50-50 women and men, but as we go up to the C-suite, we lose uh, women at the, at the top. But we now know that there is an economic uh, um, uh, imperative, you know, we know that we actually grow as leaders because we have women. Um, in leadership because they change the culture, they bring in new ideas, they really diversify it. So um, Khalid, to your point about training and focusing on investing, we think more and more now that the biggest investment in training has to be on the paradigms and the misogyny and the mindsets and the unconscious <laughs> bias that many male leaders carry so that we as you know that automatically is structured as a business that seeks to benefit women and girls just because it makes business sense not because it's just a good nice thing to do but because it actually will transform the way the business works and ultimately impact on our economy um i love that 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 statistic as i close from the uh, africa parity power of parity report that mckinsey did that says that if we truly provide equal access to women as men, our Africa economy would grow by $316 billion by 2030. So let's just do the right thing. This is what we need to do. Um, and, 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 I, and I really truly hope that the Africa is leading the world, believe it or not, in terms of women on boards. We are at about 27% of companies that have women on boards compared to 17% in the rest of the world. So we are actually leading the pack across the world, which is great news for a change. And so we just need to take that a bit further and start asking ourselves how we translate it in every single way, including looking at the violence issue, buying from women, um, you know, ensuring that we're training women every year, that our community investments um, are investments that actually contribute towards our bottom line in the way that brings more and more women businesses, women farmers, you know, um, everywhere. And I think that the, the, the championing that you are doing, Jane and, and Bridget, speaking so strongly from the perspective of women leaders in business is what, we, what should become the norm and not the exception. Um, and for you, Khalid, we invite you to join this solidarity push so that you and all the other male leaders who are the majority in our African continent will lead from in front and be the advocates so that I don't have to keep justifying myself, but you will be able to say, hey, you know what? It's the, it's the right business decision to make, not because I'm a nice guy, but because my business needs it. So thank you. Elizabeth? Thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, my name is Elizabeth Anaresh. I'm part of the team at the UN Global Compact and managing our target gender equality program around the world. I would have jumped in earlier, but I have quite a bad construction going on at my place. So I hope I have a few quiet minutes. But I think, Anne, you did an amazing job guiding this conversation. So thank you so much. And to all of the other panelists as well for being so spontaneous and really leading this very natural flowing conversation that our audience was able to witness. Um, just to also wrap it up from our side, I think you touched upon very diverse and um, different points. 
that also are actually outlined in a publication that we're launching today with additional good practices from African businesses on gender equality that touches upon three priority areas that you all um, touched upon during this conversation. So women-owned businesses, practices um, to ensure family-friendly workplaces, as well as other programs and initiatives companies can drive forward, for example, tackling sexual harassment, but also violence um, at home and in the community as well. So we'll post the link shortly so everyone can check out those practices as well. And as well. And also really grateful for Anne for also flagging the women's empowerment principles in the beginning that of course were launched together by UN Women and the Global Compact 10 years ago that provide us with this overarching framework to guide business action in the workplace, marketplace and community. And that said, I'm also very grateful to Bridget for already flagging the web's gender gap analysis tool which can be the very first step for each business to assess where they're at at within the company's performance and see where the gaps lie and also where the op opportunities lie to really advance gender equality across all different areas. We have the tool available in 10 languages now, including in French, and it's a free online resource. So we really hope that many businesses on the line can also benefit from that as it's equally applicable to big multinationals as well as smaller SMEs. And the main gap that we are seeing from the women's empowerment principles, and Anne has also flagged lots of different data throughout this session already, is that while we see that over 68% um, of companies have this commitment in place, this leadership commitment to drive um, gender equality, only 28% of companies that took the WEBS tool are actually setting concrete targets towards that change. And um, for that, I also want to congratulate Jane for mentioning um, the targets to advance gender parity within their company, as that's also something we're working towards to through Target Gender Equality, an initiative we've been rolling out across 19 countries this year to support companies in setting and meeting ambitious targets for women's representation and leadership. And Global Compact Network Kenya has been one of the countries in Africa that's really been driving this this year already. But next year, there's many other additional African countries to join this initiative, including South, South Africa. So we will be sharing more information on that as well. Um, but maybe just to wrap it up, and because the organizers gave us the heads up to be able to go a few more minutes over, maybe a very last question to all of you that we've been posing in different sessions, and it's always really interesting to hear about. Maybe you could share a really quick story about a women leader in business that inspires you to take action and that really inspires you to keep going and make this agenda a priority for you and your business. It can be a woman that you're very familiar with in your personal um, relationships or within your own company or anyone else within um, other contexts that you came across with that really left a mark for you as inspiration as a female leader. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, so feel free to volunteer and go first um, to give a few shout outs to amazing other women leaders before we close this session. I think I can go first and I don't want to shout out on anybody because I'll be in trouble. But what I can do is that if I look at our ecosystem, a majority of, uh, of our farmers are women and they are doing some fantastic jobs in terms of providing us barley or sorghum in our processes. Mm -hmm. our, uh, we contract women for third party workers and they're doing, there is a woman there who's doing an amazing job, just labor management uh, business. Our advertising uh, in terms of uh, um, a brand, what do you call it, uh, BTL or below the line advertising, we are supporting some incredible women, giving them a head start through financing and stuff. And I don't want to call their names publicly. Uh, in employment, we have some serious business women in Kenya. Again, there are so many, I wouldn't dare call out one. And then if I look at distributors, we have some fantastic distributors who distribute our brands, running major, major profit and loss accounts. So I think I want to be safe and say across the total ecosystem, from grain to glass, we have incredible women. So we are not short of examples either to emulate or to celebrate. And I could name very many if we had time, but I think, let me leave it there. Thank you. 
I will actually um, agree with uh, Jane. I love the from grain to us, Jane. We are from soil to soap. So I want to I want to echo um, that it's across the value chain, um, inspiring women you meet and you engage with every day. But ultimately, it actually comes from self, you know, from your experience growing up, what you've seen, and that teaches you to find the trailblazer women from the women who might be buying millies at the side of, of the road or the ladies putting together a hamper for Christmas um, through a process of, of saving money over 11 months. Um, we all have mothers. Um, we might have a sister, a daughter, an aunt, and we all want to change the past and work for a better future for all. So for us, the trailblazers are the generations that have come before. And I'm, I'm thinking about a Maya Angelou quote where she said, I come as one, but I stand for 10,000. Um, so I'm mindful of the fact that we all stand for at least 10,000. And it's the 10,000 um, that makes it worthwhile. And then also importantly, for upcoming women who are going to be the trailblazers, because we have managed to affect the change so that they can be even better trailblazers than the thousand before us. Shall I go? Go ahead, Anne, yes. I, I, I love that because I really struggle <laughs> with this question. I really do struggle with this question because I cannot name one woman, but I can name many women. My own mother is the first of them because she's been a tra trailblazer in, in, in being a serial entrepreneur and, and, and I don't know if it's serial and sequential at the same time uh, to be able to educate all of us as a family. So um, I start there, but I also say for me, the real women trailblazers are those who are the first in whatever mm -hmm. industry or whatever business to be able to actually drive that business. So, you know, have the Janes and um, women on the board, the first woman on a board sitting in the room with 10 men listening to their bad unconscious, you know, con unconscious bias jokes. You know, those are the women who have been able to stay there and open a path for other women. Um, and then just, you know, for women who just open um, opportunities for other women everywhere. I really think uh, in every small decision that a woman leader makes, that opens doors for many other women is truly what I feel is the most really trailblazing. I wouldn't put one single woman, there are too many to count. Thank you so much, Anne. And Khalid, um, you're free to take the same question and also even share some advice to maybe some fellow male leaders or male CEOs on how they can advance this agenda and what you would love for all other men to take on um, in order to drive this forward. Yeah, uh, thank you for this amazing question. Uh, I remember uh, a woman uh, was uh, she lives in a rural and vulnerable, uh, let's say, area, and we have run a uh, local incubator dedicated to women living in in, in a rural area. And uh, once in one year, she in the first she was very friend and small projects. It, it was difficult. To, to do business because it's too far from the from the markets. And now after a year working with her and she's very ambitious and inspiring, now they are doing export to Dubai and also able to go to China to do procurement. So when I make the the gaps or the difference between the first day involving in the incubators and now she's doing business and have at least 20, uh, 20 employees, I think woman is very really inspiring, is really a uh, story that's hard values and also innovation and, and really big ambition. This is for me the big inspiring story that I have uh, done in my career la, la, last year with the incubator done in the rural area. Thanks so much, Khalid. And I think I'll wrap it up with naming my one of my female inspiration, which is actually Musimbi Kanyoro, who was um, supposed to moderate this session today, but unfortunately had technical difficulties. Um, she's a board member of the Global Compact and we got to know her more closely as she is advising us on target gender equality. 
and she has a long-standing history and experience within civil society, foundations, etc. Previously, having been the CEO of the Global Fund for Women, so for us, it's really important and valuable to always have her input and insight from that civil society space. As of course, we're working with businesses at the Global Compact but we also have many non-businesses part of us and to truly move this agenda forward, it has to be in partnership. So we're really grateful for her continuous advice and inspiration and how we can grow and um, make this agenda relevant and um, actionable for everyone. But to wrap it up, maybe just again to, of course, thank all of you and especially Anne for also guiding this conversation so spontaneously and for all your candid and great contributions. We will share many different links after this session. Um, and as you've heard, there's been so many different stats mentioned throughout this session and a really clear business case for gender equality. Um, and to flag again, to reemphasize what Anne said before, at the end of the day, it is just the right thing to do. Even there is a strong business case for gender equality, it is also a fundamental question of human rights. And also the Secretary General calls gender equality the greatest challenge that we currently face within human rights discrimination. So thank you all for your great actions that you shared on really how companies and the private sector overall can play their role in moving this agenda forward. And also for sharing examples um, where Africa and African businesses are really leading this agenda already and the rest of the world can learn from. For example, having the most women on boards across all regions. So let's hope we can also target lots of the other areas and become leaders across different sections of gender equality. Thank you all so much. And we look forward to keep working with you and keep working with everyone on the line to really move this agenda forward jointly. Thank you.